come around this way. You want to pick up, there are more handouts up front if you want to come around. One, two, three. Okay, folks, let's get settled in. Okay. If you haven't picked up the handouts, don't worry. They'll they'll be online. You can you can download them. So how's your summer? How many of you are done? You know what I mean by done, right? You've got a job offer coming out of your sum. This is nine months of coasting, and I'm going to be the recipient of your coasting. So how many of you are decided already? Okay. So I'm going to pick on you guys, I think, <laughs> the, whole, the whole class, since you're relaxed. Um, quick, quick check before we, now I see a lot of familiar faces. How many of you were in my corporate finance class? Okay. I see a fair number not, not. So those of you in my corporate finance class kind of know what's coming, right? The torture has already begun. The screws are just going to get tighter, right? Those of you not in my corporate finance class, you don't know what you've stepped into, but you'll find out soon enough. How many of you are exchange students? Oh, that's a lot, okay. Okay, this is good, this is good, okay. <laughs> They're all in the middle, that's, that's interesting too, right? So, if you remember my corporate finance class, those of you in my corporate finance, the first class is not about specifics, it's not about details, it's about philosophy. You say philosophy, valuation, I came to learn modeling. There's no modeling in this class. You're never going to see an Excel spreadsheet in this class. And as I describe myself, I'm... <laughs> I am not an Excel ninja. I have never written a macro in my life. I never intend to write a macro in my life. I don't want to talk about macros in my life. This is a class that's going to lay the foundation for the remaining 25 sessions. 
me give you a little bit of history. I came to Stern in September of 1986. This will be my 31st, 31st year teaching at Stern. And when I came to Stern, I was given a class to teach. It's like everybody's hired as an assistant professor. The class I was given was a class called Security Analysis. You heard of this class? It's a class with a very long and hoary tradition. In fact, it was taught by a guy called Ben Graham at Columbia. And you know who? The Voldemort of finance took that class from him. So if I don't mention the words that go with, you, you, if you don't know who I'm talking about, it's Warren Buffett took the class. So that'll be the last time I mention his name and move on because it's going to be an impediment to understanding valuation if you keep letting him come up, pop up and say, hey, he said this. But it's a class with a very long tradition. But by 1986, it was showing its age. So when they gave me this class, I said, I remember going to the head of the department saying, I don't want to teach this class. This is so boring. It's a collection of topics, because here's what it looked like. It had four weeks on stocks, three weeks on bonds, two weeks on futures and options, and five weeks on institutional detail. You think, what are you talking about? I think there was an entire session on listing requirements for the New York Stock Exchange. Imagine that. Teaching was so easy the days before Wikipedia. <laughs> I could actually look up the list and actually spend 80 minutes telling you the 12 things you needed to get listed. And you say, what a genius. Today, if I tried that, you'd be checking your Wikipedia while I'm talking. Say, I see, that. I see what's coming next. So I went to the head of the department and said, I don't want to teach. Not a great attitude if you're an assistant professor who's just been hired. He said, what would you like to teach instead? It's kind of, a, he really didn't expect me to come up with an answer. But I said, I'd like to teach a valuation class. He said, don't do it. There isn't enough stuff in valuation to actually fill a class. And in 1986, he was absolutely right. There wasn't enough stuff in valuation. When I did my MBA, I think we spent perhaps 30 to 45 minutes of the entire two-year program talking about valuation. And the model we talked about is called the Gordon Growth Model. Have you seen this model? It's a stable growth dividend discount model. This is cruel and unusual punishment to equip somebody with the Gordon Growth Model and say, go out and value companies. Using the Gordon Growth Model to value companies is like using a hammer to do surgery. It's going to be bloody. The ending is not going to be good. But you're going to have a lot of fun doing it. Right? <laughs> so he said, don't do it. But I really wanted to do it. And I discovered very early in my academic life that if I wanted to get something done in academia, the best way to get it done was to do it subversively. Because if you try to do it officially, here's what would happen. A committee would be formed. You know what happens when committees get formed, right? This is where good ideas go to die. The committee will spend about five, hour, five years talking about this, and then report to another committee. This is academia. We have layers of committees. And by the time they got back to me and said, you can teach the valuation class, I'd have been ready to retire. So I said, OK, I'll teach a security analysis class. And I walked in and taught a valuation class. They had no idea what I do in a classroom, at least in 1986. Remember, there was no videotaping. I could have been talking about cooking for 25 sessions, and they'd have completely missed it. That was 1986. You know how long it took them to catch on? In 2008, I get a call from the dean's office. So we are you teaching a valuation class. I said, yes, I've been doing it for 22 years. <laughs> they said, we don't see it anywhere on the schedule. I said, that's because I've been hijacking all these other classes you've been giving me and making them valuation classes for 12 years. It was called equity instruments and markets. I have zero interest in instruments, absolutely none in markets. And I'm not that fascinated with equity to begin with. But it's a nice forum to teach a valuation class. <laughs> they said, but that's not right. We should call it valuation. I said, yes, I think so. <laughs> so in fact, if you look at the class schedule for Stern, you don't see valuation pop up to 2008 simply because I was hijacking other classes. So I've been teaching this class for 31 years. Everything I know about valuation, I've learned in the course of teaching this class. Notice how I describe this. I learned in the course of teaching this class. The first time I taught this class, I was one week ahead of my class. I had no idea what I was going to do next week. 
I'd figure something out and I'd show up and do it. Everything I write about valuation, everything I say about valuation, everything I do in valuation, I've learned in the course of teaching this class. So let's set the logistical details aside, right? You know where to find me. Actually, I've moved to a bigger room, so you know, those of you who did not visit me during corporate finance, it's still the same office, but 95% of you never found it, <laughs> which is part of the objective here is to keep moving around. Okay? So it's in KMAC 969. There's my email. That's probably the best way to get to me. I've removed my phone number entirely because I never answer my phone. I don't check voicemail, so why even put the, the phone anymore? My office hours are just before this class or just after this class. But that said, the fair game principle still applies. For those of you in my corporate finance class, you remember the fair game principle, right? Which is, if, I, if you find me, I'm fair game. So this entire semester is going to be a dance routine where I try to make sure you don't find me and you try to find me. Because if you find me, I'm stuck. You can ask me whatever question you want. There are three TAs for the class. They will have review sessions starting two weeks from now. The review sessions are just basically going to be prompts from past quizzes that they will pick up given that topic. So I'll, set, I mean, I'll send you the links for the sign-up sheets in, in case you're interested. You might not feel you're interested right now, but maybe after the first quiz you might change your mind, but keep open that possibility. So they will be your, they've all taken this class, they've all done well in the class. So they kind of know how this class works. So in a sense, they have a sense of what's coming. So now let me lay out the theme for this class. I mean, one of the most common questions I'm asked, since I talk about valuation all the time, is valuation an art or a science? And my answer is neither. And the response is, what do you mean neither? It's got to be one or the other. Let's take each part apart. What makes a science a science? Any, any scientists here, mathematicians, any engineers? Okay. What makes a science? What makes physics a science? Okay. Okay. So lo logic and, and a specific answer. And if you do think it's input output, right? If you get the inputs right, you get the output right. Physics is a science because the laws of gravity are the laws of gravity. We can all go up to the eleventh floor. We jump off the eleventh floor. Guess what? We don't fall in sequence of IQs. We all fall. I, in fact, I was in the Tower of Pisa, vastly overrated attraction. If you ask me kind of leaning, bad engineering. Somehow it's become a, you, know, you must see this before it flips over. But if you remember, Galileo checked out, I mean, it, you know, dropped stuff from the, the Tower of Pisa. Hey, so you know, laws of gravity. Physics is a science because if you get the inputs right, you get the output right. Mathematics is a pure science. You get the inputs right, your output is going to be right. Valuation is not even close to being a science. What do I mean by that? You can get every single input into a valuation right, and you can be horribly wrong. Get used to it. That's a psychological barrier. In fact, the, you know, as you think about what the barriers you have to overcome to become OK in valuation, this is one of those barriers. Don't expect confirmation that you got the right answer, because I can't give it to you. Valuation is definitely not a science. You say, that makes an art. What makes an art an art? What, what makes this Picasso guy so special? He never got the noses in the right places. Have you noticed this? Nose comes out of the side of the head. That, it's like he was drunk. But for some reason, we look at Picasso and say, that's worth 35 million. I disagree. The guy can't get the nose in the right place. I'm not paying $3.50, but for some reason, he's worth 35 million. The essence of an art especially if you're a great artist, you either have it or you don't. Thank God valuation is not an art, because if it's an art, I've spent 31 years of my life wasting my time trying to teach something that cannot be taught. So valuation is not a science. It's not an art. What the heck is it? The way I describe valuation is it's a craft. You know what it's closest to? Cooking. How do you master cooking? You could do what my daughter does. She watches the Food Network like it's going out of style all through the day. Chopped episodes one after the other, cutthroat kitchen, and sometimes I sit in and watch with her. You think you're going to master cooking by watching cooking shows? 
How about reading cookbooks? The Julia Child's book, you could highlight sections and read the whole book backwards and forward. You know what you need to do to master cooking? You've got to go to that room in your apartment called the kitchen. I know you've been avoiding this like the plague because you've been taking takeout food for the last six months, but there is a room with a stove and to learn cooking, you actually have to turn the stove on and start cooking. And the first time you cook, even if it's a scrambled eggs, it's going to taste like crap. I remember the first time I cooked scrambled eggs, nobody told me you've got to spray the damn pan. I ended up with scrambled eggs that were stuck to the pan. I learned. So now I can scramble an egg. For some reason, over 30 years of marriage, you start to accumulate jobs you did not think you had. And one of my tasks, I don't know how this happened, magically happened, is I have to cook dinner on Sundays. I don't know how this happened. It takes me forever. I have to open the cookbooks. I follow them to every last instruction. I remember the first time I had to cook something with eggs, and it said, use two large eggs. And I went to my wife and said, how do I know whether this egg is a large egg? <laughs> how large is large? And if you don't know, why do you say two large eggs? Why not two medium-sized eggs, or two small eggs, or just two eggs? But I learned. I, I'm, I, my food is edible, though. I, that's that's a advanced from where it used to be. But you learn cooking by doing. You learn valuation, not by listening to me, not by reading books, not by reading Seeking Alpha or Benjamin Graham or whatever else. You learn valuation by doing. So here's what you're going to see in this class starting tomorrow. You're going to see a valuation of the week. And your first reaction is going to be, the class just started. And here's what I'm going to do in the valuation of the week. Each week, I'll pick a company to value. What company? Something I'm interested in. It's all about me anyway. So like, like if this had been the middle of the summer, and the Pokemon go, I mean, my, my sons are grown up. And yesterday at 6.30, in the middle of dinner, my 17-year-old bolts from the table. I said, oh my god, something terrible has happened. He runs out of the house. He's gone for like 15 minutes. I'm ready to call the police, my 17 year old. And then I said, maybe he should run away. <laughs> then he comes back. <laughs> and he claims he's captured a Pikachu, whatever. Now that's the only Pokemon character I still remember. <laughs> Extraordinarily, this is a kid who's been, who has to get ready for his college application. Here he's catching Pokemon Go. But if this had been the middle of the summer, you know what I'd have picked? I'd have picked Nintendo to value. Why? Because Nintendo's value doubled as a consequence of Pokemon Go. You think that makes no sense. Let's not jump to conclusions. Maybe it does. That's why you do valuation. So I'd have valued Pokemon Go. I'd have put the valuation on as the valuation of the week. You'd have seen the spreadsheet of the valuation with my story for Pokemon Go and the assumptions. And then I'd have asked you to value Pokemon Go. And your reaction is, it's too early. I don't know enough valuation. I said, give it a shot. And here's what I predict will happen in the first week, tomorrow when you see a valuation of the week, if you give it a chance and you open that spreadsheet, if you've never done valuation before, you know what you're going to change? The fourth decimal on the risk-free rate. And you're going to leave everything else unaffected. And you're going to claim, hey, my value is just like yours. Exactly, almost to the third decimal point. And I'm going to let it go, because that's exactly where I would expect you to start. You know when I know this class is working? Is when you walk up to me in the seventh week after I valued, I don't know, Petrobras, and tell me, you're wrong. You're horribly wrong. All your assumptions are wrong. That's when I know this class is working. Because then you're saying, look, I feel ready to make assumptions that are different from yours, and it's OK. So you're going to get a valuation of the week every week for the next 14 weeks. I don't even know what I'll be valuing next week or the week after, but let's, let the, you know, let's see what comes up because there'll always be something interesting in the news and I'll try to focus in on it. And I'm going to ask you, and it's going to be, I'm not going to grade you on it, but if you really want to master valuation, I encourage you to take those valuations of the week and make them yours. I'll put my valuation of the week and I'll take, it's mine. It's my story, it's my valuation, make it yours. And that would require that you take steps away from what I'm doing, saying, hey, you know what? I'd have done it differently. 
valuation is a craft, which also means that when this class is done, if you really want to learn valuation, your job's just begun, right? Keep valuing companies. Every time I value a company, I still learn something I did not know before I value the company. So this is a process that never ends because you can never completely master this craft. You just can keep trying. Second, it's a class about valuation. And already I've got a bunch of emails from a few of you asking, are we going to value public companies or private companies? Will we be valuing startups? How about technology companies? How about franchises? And my answer is all of the above. This is a class about attaching a number to an asset. It can be a physical asset. It can be an intangible asset. It can be a company. It can be a business. It can be a franchise. I'm interested in what the value of the NFL franchise is. Not just because I'm curious, but if this is, in fact, the most successful sports franchise in the world, I'd like to know what the value of that franchise is. Not just one team, but the entire franchise. So by the end of this class, I want to talk about different ways you can attach a number to an asset. And there are different ways of thinking about what that number should be. You can do what's called an intrinsic valuation, where you try to value an asset based on its specific characteristics, which of course takes the form of a discounted cash flow valuation. You can price the asset. And you're wondering what's the difference? I'll talk about that in a moment. You might actually pull out these elaborate, sophisticated tools, option pricing models, but ultimately are attaching a number to an asset. I want to talk about valuation across the life cycle from young companies, startups, all the way to dying companies. Like who, J.C. Penney? Yahoo, dead man walking. If it's still walking, it's, I don't even think it's crawling, maybe. But essentially across the life cycle. I want to talk about valuation from the inside out and the outside. And you're saying, what are you talking about? I want to talk about valuation if you're an investor looking at a company. But I also want to talk about valuation from the perspective of a manager saying, what do I need to do to increase the value of the company? So during the course of this class, we'll switch roles. We look at different kinds of assets. And in the process, what I hope you will see is what they all share in common. There will be differences in estimation processes. But you're going to see very quickly, if you dig a little deeper, valuation stays. The fundamentals don't change just because you're valuing a startup. Now let me talk about the contrast between price and value. I'm going to try really hard on this dimension, but I'm going to fail. I'm going to try not to use the words value and price as if they're interchangeable. Here's what I mean by the difference. We know what drives value. I've already given away the secret for this class. The value of an asset is driven by its cash flows, its growth, and its risk. You can dress this up as much as you want, but it's driven by fundamentals. And the tool we use to estimate value can be discounted cash flow valuation. It can be accounting valuation, but you're trying to value an asset. You think, what else is there to do? You could price the asset, right? What drives price? Demand and supply. What drives demand and supply? God only knows. It could be mood. It could be momentum. It could be the fact that Pokemon Go is in the news, and therefore you want to push up the price. Once you differentiate between value and price, a lot of things that don't seem to make sense start to make sense. How many of you worked at investment banks over the summer? My condolences. <laughs> investment banks claim to value stuff, right? Don't believe that for a moment. Investment banks price things. Why? Because they've got to get transactions done. There's nothing wrong with pricing, but let's be honest about this process. I'm just doing a blog post that's going to get me a whole lot of grief because I'm going to take on three investment banks in one post. Not a good idea, generally. But I'm going to take on the three investment bankers involved in the Tesla Solar City deal. This is incompetence run rampant. We'll talk about why it's happened and how it's happened, but it's incredibly bad stuff that's happening under the, you know, under the numbers. But here's the simple explanation. The bankers, all three bankers, will make money only if the deal goes through. Once you see that, you will recognize very quickly why they do the things they do. 
their job is to get transactions done. That's not the banker's fault. It's your fault if you act as if the banker is valuing stuff. Bankers don't value IPOs, they price them. Bankers don't value target companies, they price them. Equity research analysts, when they say buy recommendation, they're not saying this company is undervalued, they're saying it's underpriced. Let's start using the word price when what you're seeing is pricing. And 90% of what you see is pricing, and use the word value when, it really mean, when you really mean it. So we're gonna talk about that contrast through this class and how you can get different numbers for the same asset if you're valuing the asset as opposed to pricing it, which creates a conundrum, right? So which one do I use? You start to figure out which one you use depending on what role you're playing in that transaction. Fourth, and this is, a, this is something, as I said, much of what I do in valuation I've learned in the course of doing this class. When I first started this class, I taught it very differently than how I teach it now. The, the numbers, the, the philosophy might be the same, but I taught it differently. And to understand the difference, I'm going to start with a question. I don't know whether I asked this question during the corporate finance class, but I'm going to ask it again if I did. I'd like you to look inwards. There's no right answer to the question, so don't look at your neighbor, don't look at me. And here's the question I have for you. If I asked you to categorize yourself today, would you more naturally think of yourself as a number cruncher or are you more naturally a storyteller? It sounds too abstract. Let me make this about how I came to that decision. I knew very early. I knew, in fact, when I was about 12 or 13, which side of this divide I was on. I knew it right after I took my first English literature class. And I was asked to read Moby Dick. And I did. It's a good kid, I did whatever I was asked to do. And I thought it was a book about a whale and Captain Ahab. So I show up in class the next day, prepared to talk about whales and captains. And the instructor gets up and starts talking about the hidden meanings in the book. And my reaction was, really? Herman Melville meant that? There was no whale? I distinctly remember a big whale. This is like Life of Pi. When I read Life of Pi, I really thought it was about an idiot who gets on a raft with a tiger. Nothing good <laughs> can come out of this. But then I find out there was no raft, no tiger, no cook. All of this was something standing in for something else. And I remember coming out of that class saying, never again am I going to subject myself to that kind of bullshit. <laughs> and my life after that was laid out for me. I avoided the literature classes like the plague. It was Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Algebra 3, out of there. And these were the days before universities made you waste your first two years doing these core classes. We know, you know why we need that, right? Because without them, history departments would cease to exist and literature departments would cease to exist. So for the first two years, I say, great literature, you gotta read all this stuff because without this, you will never be a complete human being. Yes, I believe you. But in those days, you could just take math classes if you wanted. So I went through college without ever seeing any more social science classes. You graduate, you go work in numbers, you're a number cruncher. In fact, if you believe the legend of the left brain and the right brain, the left brain being what controls logic and numbers and the right brain, I destroyed my, I bludgeoned my right brain. Say, so don't even get up from there. So when I first started teaching this class, I was a number cruncher and guess what? If you're a number cruncher, that's where you go for comfort. Because here are the delusions of number crunchers. We think because we use numbers, we are more precise. You know what we do when we're in doubt? We add decimals. You notice this? When in doubt, just add decimals. The value of 31.5 doesn't look precise enough. Make it 31.53, 31, and in Excel, you can keep going, right? You can make the entire page one big column with 500 decimals. We also think that because we work with numbers, we're being objective. Say, what bias? Look, I use the growth rate from IBES. I use the beta from BARA. I use the, so in a sense, your argument is, I use numbers, I'm not being biased. And you also think because you work with numbers, you're in control. Do you notice this? If you put a number on something, you feel you control it. 
Because this took its most radical form in banks pre-2008 when they looked at that value at risk and said, we're in control. Yes, until you lose control. So those are the delusions I brought to the process. But the dangers of, especially if you work with numbers enough, you realize very quickly there is no precision. You can be incredibly biased, and you really have no control. But that's on the number crunching side. But let's go back to that same class that I walked out of and saying, never again will I take a literature class. There were people in that class who liked the hidden meaning stuff. They like they write poetry, and it doesn't even rhyme. <laughs> My son writes poetry, and I said, well, the words are supposed to rhyme. Aren't they rhyme, Kieran? And he says, no, that's old-fashioned poetry. This is free form. They said, this is so incredible. And they take literature one, literature two, literature three. And they go off to college. History major at Yale. Now here's what happens. Your number crunch is going to engineering, math, actuaries. And after about five years of boring themselves to death, they say, I'm going to go back to business school. And some of you are here. You know, recovering engineers, recovering mathematicians, recovering, you know. So. And of course, the history majors go to work and they find a different problem, which is even Yale history majors don't get paid very much. And they come back to school as well, five years later, into the same classroom, and you're all here. So let me ask you a question. How many of you would more naturally think of yourselves as number crunchers? How many of you are most naturally storytellers? It's actually not bad. It's almost 50-50, right? And I'm happy about that. Because here's my job. By the end of this class, because I see valuation as a bridge between stories and numbers, here's what I hope will happen. I want the storytellers to develop some discipline. You can see why, right? Because if you're a storyteller, you kind of get carried away. You forget where reality ends and fantasy begins. We're going to talk about the sad but true story of Theranos somewhere during the course of this class to illustrate the danger of a runaway story, a story that sounds so good that nobody wants to stop and ask tough questions. That's the danger of storytelling. I'd like you to learn enough number crunching that you can develop some discipline in your storytelling. And if you're a number cruncher, here's what I hope will happen. Remember that right brain that you've bludgeoned to death? It's still alive. It's just barely alive. By the end of this class, I hope you develop an imagination. In other words, trust your imagination. Tell a story. It's OK. You can have loose ends. It's fine. So I want disciplined storytellers and imaginative number crunchers. Guess who I'm going to have a tougher, tougher time with? Is it more difficult to get a storyteller to develop discipline or a number cruncher to let go of their imagination? It's not even close. You give me 100 history majors from Yale, I have a much easier time than if you give me 100 ex-bankers or 100 engineers or 100 accountants. Because valuation is not complex. Developing discipline doesn't take that much work. But letting go of a lifetime of something you've been taught, which is don't be fuzzy on me. Don't tell stories is really tough to do. So let's see how far we get towards that objective. Because towards the end of the semester, I'll put that up and say, if you're a storyteller, did you develop enough discipline during this class to become good at valuation? If you're a number cruncher, were you willing to let your imagination go? Which brings me to the final theme for this class. I'm often accused of being an academic. In fact, I can almost guarantee that this blog post that goes out today that's going to classify investment bankers involved in this deal into the lazy, the incompetent, and the venal, and you can take your pick of which one is which, is going to get some backlash. And one of the biggest insults, somebody, a practitioner, you're an academic. The way they say it, in fact, the, the, the contempt oozes out of the word. There's nothing academic about valuation. 
There's no theory in valuation. You, I'm going to very quickly dispense with the notion that there's any theory. Valuation is not an academic exercise. It's a pragmatic exercise. It's an exercise designed to evoke action. And that's really tough to do. Doing valuation is easy. Acting on that valuation is really, really difficult. Because to act on your valuation, you need two things. And they're both based on faith. First, you have to have faith that your valuation actually is the, and you're going to find that that is really tough to get. So at first, you have to have enough faith in your valuations that you're saying, I'm willing to act on this valuation. You know the other faith you need is? Remember we talked about value and price being different processes? To make money in your valuation, you have to have faith not only in your own valuation, but faith that the market will correct its mistakes. And what's the essence of faith? Somewhere in the second or third week, you're going to say, can you prove to me that the market price is going to move to the value? And I'm going to say, why don't you look up the definition of faith? The essence of faith is you've got to accept it without proof. And that, I think, is the challenge that some of you will wrestle with and decide by the end of this class that you're not willing to go there. And that's perfectly OK. Because you're going to say, I've learned valuation. I can read other people's valuations. I'm not going to do it because I have neither the faith in my own valuations nor the faith that markets will correct their mistakes, which is really what an efficient market person believes, right? They've essentially said, you know what? I know markets make mistakes, but I don't have enough faith that I can find those mistakes and enough faith that those mistakes will get corrected. So this is a class about action, and I can't give you faith. But I, what I'll try to do is give you a window into when I start to lose faith. When will that happen? I'll value a company, and I'm sure over the 15 weeks I'm valuing 15 companies, that I'm going to do a valuation in week two and tell you that the stock is undervalued. And three weeks later, the stock is going to have dropped by 50%. And I'm going to get up and say, you know what, I feel a little shaky about my valuation. And I'm going to be open about it, because that's how you say, but I have few faith. You shouldn't question. Mother Teresa became a saint over the weekend, right? And in one of most, her most famous exchanges, and this was when she was in her 70s, she said, every day she woke up and she questioned the existence of God. If Mother Teresa can question the existence of God, you and I can question our own valuations. That's fine. Okay? So don't sit there and say, and that's what makes me so mad when I see people who are rigid about value. Like who? All those people who show up in Omaha every year, who act like they're the chosen ones. Let it go. The essence of faith is sometimes you've got to question that faith, and perhaps you will lose the faith, and perhaps you'll come out of it stronger. But the only thing I can do is put at least an opening to where you can see me questioning my own faith, and you can see it play out with the numbers. So in terms of the structure of the class, for this class, as you can see, I've set the table. Next class, I'm going to lay out what I call the big picture. I'm going to talk about the basis for intrinsic valuation, the basis for pricing, the basis for option pricing. So at least you can see why the two approach, or the three approaches give you different numbers. Then we're going to spend about 10 sessions talking about the fundamentals. What are those? Cash flows discount rates, and growth rates. And if you remember your corporate finance, this should be, some of this should be reviewed. But if you don't, don't worry. I'll act like you've forgotten it all over the summer. But we'll talk about, again, how we measure risk, how we convert it. And you're saying, but that was corporate finance. This is valuation. Guess what? It's the same principle. So we're going to spend about 10 sessions talking about those fundamentals. And during those sessions, you're going to get impatient. Because you know when are we going to get actually value companies? So you'll have to wait and wait and wait. Because after you've done all the fundamentals, you've done the dirty work, we're going to hit them. You know, there's a couple of sessions where all we're going to do is value companies, different companies, emerging market, developed market, young companies, old companies, declining companies, growing companies, private, public. But that takes us through the middle of the semester, and we're going to have, by the middle of the semester, all the tools we need to do intrinsic valuation or valuing an asset, or any kind of asset. 
somewhere mid-semester on the 15th or 16th session, I'm going to change gears. I'm going to say, but what if your job is to price things? You're an investment banker, you're an appraiser, you're a real estate agent. Your job is not to tell me what the value of my house is, to tell me what price I need to pay to buy this house today. It'd be hubris on my part to say, intrinsic valuation is the right way to do things when your job is pricing things. So I'm going to turn to pricing and how to do pricing right. That sounds mysterious, but we're going to talk about multiples, P-E ratios, price to book, EBITDA, EBITDA. You get hit with all these multiples. How do you use a multiple right to actually price an asset? And the, pro the challenge we're going to face is not a financial challenge. It's a statistical challenge of trying to take data of small samples or big samples, where the data is pulling us in different directions and trying to come up with a number. So that's about five sessions we're going to talk about pricing. Every multiple that I can think of and essentially a way of thinking through any other multiple you might run into somewhere down the road. Then we're going to spend about three sessions on perhaps the only aspect of valuation that is new and different. Option pricing has been around in finance for about 45 years. Trace back to Fisher Black and Marin Scholes and the Black Scholes model. If you're taking a futures and options class, you have your set of option pricing models, right? You're going to talk about how to use option pricing models to value listed options and warrants and convertibles. I am not in the least bit interested in using option pricing models to value listed options or warrants or convertibles. There's a different class for that. I'm interested in using option pricing models in the context of business. Like what? If I came to you with a natural resource company, an oil company with undeveloped results, let's make it Petrobras. You go back about three years or four years in the glory days of Petrobras, when it was the largest market cap company in Latin America. What drove its market value so high? It's because it found reserves all over the place, right? It claimed to find reserves under you know, Rio, under Sao Paulo, under the ocean, under, under the mountains. I mean, if you took them at their word, they have lots of reserves. The only problem is the average cost right now of developing those reserves could be 55 to $60. So what's your reaction? At an oil price of 45, those reserves are worth nothing, right? That's not true. And here's why. That $45 is the price today. Could it go up to 100? Sure. Could it go to 20? Yes. We don't know what oil prices will do in the future, which means that those reserves, even though they're not viable today, have an option value. They're like out of the money options. Do you see why? Because if oil prices go to 75, magically those reserves become valuable. To value an oil company, you can use option pricing to value those undeveloped reserves. To value a young pharmaceutical company, a biotechnology company, where essentially the only asset they have is this blockbuster drug patent working its way through the pipeline. There's no revenues, no cash flows yet. You are valuing an option. So we're going to draw an option pricing in these very specific cases to think about how it affects our views and value. And then we'll get to the last three sessions. And in the first of those sessions, I'm going to talk about acquisition valuation. This is the graveyard where valuation first principles go to die. More damage gets done to valuation in M&A than in any other aspect. We'll talk about why. There's a simple reason it happens. So I'm going to talk about what's different about acquisition valuation, what should be the constant. And in particular, I'm going to confront those two magic words that always show up in acquisitions, control and synergy. Let's stop using those as buzzwords. Let's think about what they should actually be valued as. And then I'm going to, in the, in the second to last session, turn my attention back to corporate finance. It's been a long journey, but by that session, we've looked at valuation from the outside and look at how would I value a company as an investor. I'm going to turn it back and say, if you were the manager in a company and I gave you the task of increasing, I put you as CEO valued. Your, your first response is, I don't want the job, but let's say you took it. Say, so increase the value of the company. What are the levers you have under your control? to change the value of a company. And there you're going to see actually much of what we did in corporate finance come back in the context of valuation because effectively you have far more control over the way the company is run. And maybe in the process we'll get some insight into why an activist investor might actually value Morgan Stanley at a higher number than what the market is and what Morgan Stanley has to do to deliver, deliver that higher number. And the last session is going to be about you. 
in a minute you're going to see what I mean by that because during the course of this class, each of you is going to pick a company. So already I've given you the starting so you can get started. Start thinking about a company in your head. And you're going to value that company using every single metric and approach we use in this class. So by the end of this class, you're going to have an intrinsic valuation of a company, a pricing of your company, maybe even an option pricing model of a value of your company. And I'm going to ask you to top it all off by saying, if you had to act on these valuations, what would you do today? And you can give me three answers. You can say, I'll buy. No weaseling up. No strong buy, weak buy, semi-strong buy. I feel like I'll buy. No. You buy or you sell. And in some rare cases, I'll let you be chicken. You know what that is? It's called hold. Which you know, I really don't know. So I'll let you get away with it, but I'll push you. I'll push you to act. Not because I, I'm going to go out and buy what you ask me to buy. I'm not crazy. But because I want you to start thinking about what do you need to get as confirmation before you would actually act on your valuation. It's really more about your actions than about what I expect of you. And the last class, what I'll do is I'll collect the numbers, just like I did in corporate finance, where I asked you for the numbers in the last weekend. I will ask you for the numbers on your company. And let's see what percentage of the companies in this class come out as undervalued and overvalued. And let's face it, one of the great things about valuation is we don't know what's coming over the rest of the semester. I started my fall 2008 class at roughly the same time I'm starting this one, two days after Labor Day. And I started it with that delusion that I used to operate under where you had developed markets where things don't change very much very quickly and emerging markets where things can change a lot very quickly and I discovered very quickly over the next three months that the line between developed and emerging markets can disappear in a second, that a market you thought was nice and stable could vary. So we have no idea what's coming in the next, and that's what makes it fun, is you have no idea, and you've got to adapt and adjust and use your valuation tools to deal with the stuff that you come up with. I sent you these links before, so it's too late to do pre-season prep. Okay. But it's, it's really not. You, know, you can still spend the weekend. So really, there are three things I would like you to be able to do. I'd like you to be able to read accounting statements. I don't care whether you can debit and credit stuff, whether you can do the footnotes, you can do all the little accounting. I really don't care. But I need you to know the difference between operating income and net income. Between the items on the balance sheet that are marked to market and items that are not. So I want you to be able to read a, a financial statement. It's impossible to do valuation without the raw data you get from financial statements. So that's the first lab. Second, I know m most of us after our statistic class, when it ends, we say, thank God that's over. I hope to never see this again. Have some bad news? You're gonna see it again and again and again in this class. Remember that multiple regression chapter? I know you don't, but act like you do. I'm gonna draw on that. We're going to, use, this is exactly what statistics was designed for. Large amounts of data. You talk about money ball, you can't play money ball in a better environment than the financial markets. You've got so much data. So if you think you've lost your statistics, kind of reclaim it. Again, basic stuff. And finally, it is true that I will draw on some tools from previous finance classes, risk and return. I'm not going to derive the cap M in this class. I didn't derive it in the corporate finance class. Why would I do it now? But I will draw on basic tools. Present value. If you still are fighting with your calculator about that PV button, win. Wrestle with it. Get on top. You want to still enter cash flows by year and then discount each one? I will get you on the quiz. I will actually write a problem to separate those people who are still entering 10 cash flows individually because they're too worried about the payment button on their calculator. Present value is basic. And finally, there is some aspect. So I will draw in terms that we used in corporate finance, like free cash flow equity. Do you remember that term? Again, act like you do. But we talked about it in the context of dividend policy, it's potential dividend. I'll draw on that, but I will again, as I said, fill in enough detail so I don't leave you completely in the dark. But if you feel that you're not quite ready on any of these, at least spend a little time kind of sprucing up what you remember. 
So now let me describe the torture I will put you through. It is by day of the week. So every day of the week, there will be a different torture I've devised for you. Mondays and Wednesdays, of course, are class time, right? So Monday, there will be a class, and there'll be an email after class. About what? About what we talked about in class today, perhaps an extension. So this is your easy day. If, if Monday was, to, you know, was today, it would be an easy day. Tuesday will be the valuation of the week. So I'll put out the valuation of the week. I'll send you an email. I'll put it up on the webcast page for this class. I'll put up a Google Shared spreadsheet. And I'm going to let you play with the valuation and enter your numbers. On Wednesday, we'll have class like we did today. And right after the class, not this week, but starting next week, you get what I call a weekly challenge. What the heck is that? Taking what we've done that week in class and kind of making you stretch. Stretch in what sense? It's just going to be out of your reach. You can't just read the notes and answer it. It's going, I'm going to test you on, can you take what we did in class and kind of extend it? How much of my grade will depend on it? Zero. Why would you do it? It's up to you. Again, I'm not going to keep tabs on whether you do it. I'll throw out a weekly challenge every week. I mean, this class has been described as like trying to drink out of a hose. I'm going to hose everywhere. I'm going to hit you with this high-pressure hose. And you can take a little bit of water if you want, if you're thirsty. You can say, OK, I'm moving away from this torture. If that, that's what you need. But you get a weekly challenge. That weekly challenge, you will have four days to work on. Because on Sunday, I will send you my solution to the weekly challenge. And if you've done the weekly challenge, you can check it off and see whether you know, your answer matches mine. On Thursday, I will update you on your project. Remember I said you have this company to value. This is my, my prod of how, where are you on the project? Have you picked a company yet? Have you picked a company yet? Are you picking a company now? Are you looking up the financials? I know you'll ignore me for like 13 weeks of this class. But somewhere in the last week, all these emails. So I'll keep tabs. I'll, I'll keep an archive of all these emails. And that last week, I'm going to send you the entire archived email set saying, remember in week one, I asked you whether you picked a company? In week two, whether you pulled up the financials? Well, your goose is cooked. Do it now. Okay? On Friday, I'll do a webcast for this class. Some of these I've already done. So essentially, what are these webcasts about? Taking something very practical, like when we capitalize you know, R&D, we'll talk about how to convert R&D from an operating to a capital expense. I'll pick a company with a lot of R&D, let's say Apple, and talk about how I, you know, where I go for the data, how I'd convert it. So essentially, it's a 15 to 20 minute webcast on just working through the numbers using an actual company. Saturday, you'll get a newsletter. What will it say? Not much, so just don't read this for breaking news. It's really going to tell you, this is what we did this week. This is where we're going. It's like a GPS. Think of it as a GPS, where you are and where you expect to go. Again, I do this because it's easy to get lost in a class of this size in over 15 weeks. Because there's, I know you have other stuff in your life. Sometimes I wish you didn't, but I know you do. You have other classes. You've got you know, significant others. Maybe some of you have kids. All of that stuff is going to crowd in your life. And of course, it's going to take your attention away. So the weekly newsletter is going to say, you've lost attention for a couple of weeks, but maybe you want to come back. This is where we are in the class. And Sunday, as I said, they will post the weekly challenge and give you a preview for what's coming for the rest of the class. So I have very few rules in this class. I'm like, you know, I don't have Bill Silber's personality to kind of intimidate you and say, if you do that, I will kill you, you know, or charge you $50 or whatever. So, you know, so I, the, here are my rules. First is, if you can be on time, that's great. But I'd rather have you here than not at all. So if you're going to be 15 minutes late, I'd still rather have you here 15 minutes late than not at all. So don't stand outside the door. Oh my God, I'm late. I can't go in. Just come in. Okay? Second, bring your lecture. The only thing you will need for this class are the lecture notes. Okay? The lecture note packets are in the bookstore. I saw packet one at least. But packet two and three should be there as well. They, you can download them. If you don't want to spend the money in the bookstore, download them and print them. Just Remember what I said in corporate finance, don't print them on the printers, otherwise I'll hear about it. Because 250 people all print off 800 pages of lecture notes, which is roughly what we have in this class. Every printer in this building will break. And then I'll get a call saying, what the hell have you done? So if you're going to do this, do this. If you worked over the summer and they still let you in, you still have the ID probably from the summer, just sneak in. <laughs> They have these big, expensive printers, and they're collecting $2 million for doing crappy valuations. 
so don't feel any qualms about just using the, the Lazard printer, the Goldman Sachs printer, or the Evercore printer, or whoever the printer is. So bring your lecture notes. I know some of you will have to miss classes. Why? Lots of different reasons. Okay. Whatever the reason, though, if you miss a class, there's no excuse for not catching up, because that class will be available on multiple forums. It'll be available as a, you know, you, as a stream, which of course means you need a broadband connection. That's probably the richest choice, because everything's going to be in front of you. You can download, I'll, I'll set it up as a YouTube video. The advantage of YouTube, of course, is it adjusts to bandwidth. And this is actually my attempt to become the Kim Kardashian. I've given up on uh, Lady Gaga. So basically, I'd like you on the subway watching my lecture on an iPhone. This is, I, I won't look over, oh my god, it's my lecture. So a YouTube video, because it'll kind of stream through even underground. Right? It'll be a, there'll be a downloadable video file and downloadable audio for that really boring plane flight where you're planning to catch up on really bad movies, which is what I usually do. Maybe you can watch really bad lectures instead. So you know, both of those will be there. I have, I have lots of different choices in terms of books, but let me tell you, you can live without any of them. My publishers all hate it when I say this, so you don't have to have any of these books. If you're picking a book that is a textbook for the class, investment valuation is really the only one of these books that is a textbook. Okay. The other books are more practitioner books. The little book of valuation is for those people who really want to spend only $15, get a book, read it all in like two hours, that's fine too. And there is going to be a new book coming out during the course of this semester. And I'll let you know if it comes out before the end of the semester about tying stories to numbers, about this, this, this concept of how every valuation is a story behind and every story has number attached to it. So I'll tell you when that comes out. I do have an app for the iPhone and the iPad if you go to the, the, the Apple Store, which, you can, which is a, an intrinsic valuation app. Again, it does what we do in the class, so if you just want to kind of play around with it, you're welcome to. Okay. Now, as far as staying connected to this class, first, there is a website for the class. That's pretty much the central place to go for everything related to the class. And I've sent you this link three times already, so if you haven't found it yet, click on it. I am looking at social media sites. I haven't found one that I like yet. I used Yellow Dig last semester. Most people didn't use it. It wasn't great. So I'm, 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 I get at least a half a dozen calls from people who built some new, new way of presenting a class. I'll pick one of those and maybe experiment with it. But the, uh, on Apple iTunes U, you can actually, you'll actually see this entire class unfold. So you don't need an Apple device to be on iTunes U. You can actually use an Android. You can, and the nice thing about iTunes U is like all things Apple, it's pretty neatly set up. It's you know, much more structured. But if you, do, if you don't want to deal with Apple's entry and exit requirements, then you can use the YouTube playlist that I would set up for the class. So pretty much everything in this class will kind of unfold as we go through. And there is more. There is a Google Calendar that I've already sent you for this class. So you will know when the quizzes are and when the final exam is, and I'll go through the dates very quickly. I will, when I post something on my blog, I will send you, because it's almost always going to be valuation connected. It'll be connected to something we do in the class. There's a Twitter feed, you know, you know which I will, you know, just don't tweet in the middle of a class. It's so obvious because I can tell what time the tweet went out. Okay. So if you're going to tweet, at least wait. Give me the, 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 at least the, the sense that you're actually here. It'll be right after the class ends. And if, you're, if you want other stuff, I'll, you, I'll, I'll give you links to past blog posts mostly on every single topic that we talk about, starting with risk-free rates. Now, what do we do about negative risk-free rates in Switzerland? So I'll link you up to posts I've done in those because those are all very specific to what you might face in the context of your evaluation. Now here's the unpleasant stuff. There's a grade for this class, as you well know. That grade is going to reflect my judgment. So I'm not going to act like this is all objective. It's not multiple choice. It's not objective. There is a subjective component. Okay? But uh, at the end of this class, here's what I hope to see. If you can value just about anything, then I want to give you an A. So my, no. If you can value most things, I'm going to give you a B, B plus. If you can value some things, well, that's a very low threshold. See, if you can value nothing at the end of this class, then I've completely failed. 
so we'll collectively get an F, though you'll be the only one with an F on your transcript. Yeah. <laughs> it's very difficult to fail this class. It's very difficult to fail this class because you've got to try. So you almost have to consciously set up saying, I'm going to try not to learn how to value anything, which strikes me as a strange objective you were sitting in in this class. Yeah. So here's how I'm going to try to gauge where you fall in this, in this hierarchy. There, is going to be, there are going to be two group projects, and I'll very quickly describe them in a minute. One is, of course, this valuation of a company that will run through the entire semester. And the other is going to be what I call a mystery project. What's in it? Well, if I told you, it wouldn't be a mystery anymore. So we'll come back, you know, it's something that I will pick up somewhere in the middle of the semester, perhaps something in the news, and make that the basis for the mystery project. So the big project, as I call it, which runs all the way through the semester, is worth 30%. The mystery project will be 10%. So collectively, group projects are going to be 40%. But the reality is the spread on group projects is never going to be that wide because Somebody in a group always picks up. The, you never have a truly abysmal group. Let me take that back. Once in a while you do. No. But somehow something seems to happen, so miracles happen at the end. No. So the real spread happens on the quizzes. And there will be three quizzes for this class, about three weeks apart. So, uh, so it's almost like the first quiz in the fourth week, the seventh week, the tenth week. So I've listed the dates for the quizzes. They're all in the first 30 minutes of class. And like corporate finance, I will get another classroom so that you can get some room to spread out. But they're open book, open notes, first 30 minutes of class, followed by regular class after the quiz. The final exam right now is scheduled for Friday, December 16th from 1 to 3. And since the very last class is December 4th, usually I give an early final if there's lots of room between my last. This time, the final exam is within less than 48 hours after the final class, so I don't think there's much room to get an early exam. So I think we'll stick with the December 16th, 1 to 3, and it will also be open book, open notes, cover everything. And you can read these requirements for the quiz. It's open book, open notes, but make sure you read these so that you kind of know what's, what's coming, because if you do miss a quiz, you don't lose the 10%, it'll get moved to what's left in the class. So if you miss the first quiz, the 10% will get moved to the second, the third quiz, and the final. If you miss the second quiz, it will get moved to the third quiz and the final. If you miss the third quiz, the reason for that is very simple. If I let you move your scores, then you get strategic quiz missing. So if you do really well in the first two quizzes, then you'll miss the third quiz to make the first two wait more. So in a sense, it will always get pushed out to what's left in the class. The cost of missing a quiz is I do give you the option or I take the option of taking your worst quiz and replacing it with your average score in, on a, all the other exams. So as an example, if your worst quiz you get two and you get 80% on your other quizzes, I'll take the two and replace with an eight. But that works only if you take all three quizzes. So there's, there is a price you pay for missing a quiz, even though you don't lose that 10%. And finally, on group work, I'm going to let you pick your own groups. Why? Because I, I don't want to live with the consequences. So you pick the group, you live with the group. You police the group, you do whatever you need to do to get the group done. In very, very severe cases of dysfunctional groups, I will step in, but I'd prefer not to be involved. So start thinking about who you want in your group and more importantly, who you don't want in your group. Right? So that's important. And the advantage of being second year is you know who to avoid and who to seek out. So I'll let you make that judgment. If you're exchange students, a little tougher, but I'll, I'm sure you land on your feet. So that's pretty much the, the logistics for the class. Let me very quickly set up. Projects for the class. As I said, these, these, the, 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 there are two projects. The first is what I call this big project that runs through the entire semester. It is a group project, but it's going to be due in two parts. Unlike corporate finance, where I let everything kind of ride till the very last session. Notice in corporate finance, there was nothing you had to turn in until that very last date, right? In this class, I will actually ask you to turn in your discounted cash flow evaluation halfway through the semester, not for a grade, but for feedback. It's optional. You know why I do this? This is especially the case in the spring semester. In the spring semester, we have a problem with what I call premature graduation. 
It's when you graduate in March or February and you stop. Yeah. So this is my way of saying, I know by April you're not even thinking about class. You're looking at graduation. So I want you to get something done while you still have some motivation. So it's going to be due in two parts, one halfway through the class and one of the very last session. Okay. And here's what's involved in the project. Each of you within a group has to pick a company. So let me be very specific. You have five people in the group. You have five companies. Seven people, you have seven companies. You're going to pick a company. That company, unlike corporate finance, where I kind of forced you away from certain groups, it's free. It's, you can pick pretty much any company you want, private or public. If it's a private company, make sure you can get the financials. But here is the overall constraint. At least one person in every group has to pick a money-losing company. Why? Because it is much more difficult to value a money-losing company than a money-making company. At least one person in every group has to pick a high-growth company. Revenue growth, it doesn't have to be making profit. So if you want to pick Snapchat, be my guest. Right? At least one person in each group has to pick a non-US company, no cheating, no doing ADRs. You have to value the company in the local listing, usually in the local currency. And finally, at least one company that's not a manufacturing company. And that's a really easy requirement to meet today because 80% of companies are not manufacturing. So you can pick financial service, retail, you know, whatever. So that's the overall constraint. Now, of course, if one person in the group meets multiple constraints, it relaxes the other. So what I would suggest is there will be a few people in this class who will not be able to find a group. Remember last semester what I did with them? I created an orphan list, and I put them up for adoption. You see, that's awful. Hey, would you want to have no group at all? Here's one of the tactics you could try. Let's say you're a group of five, and an orphan approaches you. You can put conditions. You can say, you can be part of a group as long as you pick a high growth, money losing, non-US <laughs> service company. All four, all four constraints met at the same time. No? So I will let you play whatever entry and exit games you want to play, but no, that's the overall constraint, is make sure that at least somebody in your group. And I'll tell you something. If the if you pick an easy company to value, you will learn a lot less than if you pick a difficult company to value. And your grade is not, when I grade, I know if you pick Con Ed that your job is a slam dunk. So don't explain, that that looks really precise, I'll give you a lot of points. You pick Twitter, your job is, it is you know, already you know you have a problem because the company doesn't know what it's doing, it doesn't know what business it's in. It's got management that needs adult supervision. All of these things will start to come into evaluation. And I will factor that in when I look at evaluation. Okay? So I will put up a list in case you're concerned about high growth and negative earnings firms, but I will let that choice be yours. So here's what you're going to be doing in the first half of the class. You're going to do an intrinsic valuation of your company. And you're going to start off by telling me a story about your company. For the moment, that will sound completely abstract. But as we go through this class, I'll flesh out what I mean by that and convert the story into a DCF. And turn in that DCF on November 4th, I think I'm at a two different dates, I said October 30th, I'll tell, you know, go back to the Google Calendar, it tells you exactly which date it is. Remember, this is not for grades, this is basically you turning in your DCF and I'll take a look at it and get it back to you saying, with either questions or suggestions on changes. Okay? You can make those changes, you don't have to make those changes, but this is just feedback. After you've done that and turned it in, then I'm going to ask you to price your company relative to other companies in the sector. And already you can see a challenge. You know, if I have an Indian steel company, should I compare to other Indian steel companies? You'll have to wrestle with those choices of what you mean by comparable, how you're going to control for differences, and you have to price the company. Then I'm going to ask you to price your company relative to the entire market. So what's the difference? Pricing a social media company against other social media companies, you might come up with one number for Facebook. Pricing Facebook against the rest of the market, you could come up with a very different number because you're comparing against a different set of companies. So by step four, you're going to have an intrinsic value for your company, a pricing of your company against the sector, and a pricing of your company against the market. Step five, if it works, and only a subset of your companies will this be true, I'll ask you, maybe you can try an option pricing model. For about one in five companies, you'll see some additional chance of using an option pricing model and maybe coming up with a fourth valuation of your company. So by step five, you could conceivably have four different values for your company. An intrinsic value, 
a pricing against the sector, a pricing against the market, and an option pricing value. And then I'm going to put you on the spot and say, what are you going to do about it? And that's when I'm going to push you, make her, and you're going to say, well, should I trust my intrinsic value? Should I go with my pricing? And I'm going to push the choice back on you and say, there is no right answer. You have to decide based on how you feel about these approaches. So that's going to be the big project. As I said, it's going to run through the entire semester. And your companies within a group don't have to bear any resentment. Unlike corporate finance, where I made you all pick you know, steel companies or telecom companies, you can pick whatever company as long as you meet those constraints. So that's going to be the, the big project. The mystery project, as I said, we'll come up with something. Right? There'll be something interesting that happens. If this had been last semester, I might have thrown in Brexit in there. What do you think Brexit will do to the valuation of UK companies? I think that's a big question. You have the tools to be able to answer pretty much any big question in valuation. So along the course of the semester, I'll pick something that's in the news and make that your mystery project. Any questions on the projects? So let me at least get started on this big picture part that is. When I first started teaching this class in 1986, I made the mistake of assuming that everybody else was as interested in valuation as I was. And I discovered very quickly that this was a horrible mistake, that most people don't believe in valuation. By most people, I include most people who do valuation for a living, don't believe in valuation. You think, but they do it all the time. They do it because it's their job. They do it to cover their rear ends. But if you caught them in an honest moment and asked them, why is Tesla trading at $204 per share? Their answer is going to be because that's what the market thinks it's worth. Most people don't believe in valuation. Now, I can't explore why they don't or what they do about it. But I believe in valuation, otherwise I wouldn't be teaching this class. So I want to start off by telling you why I do valuation. I do valuation to fight the lemming in me. You familiar with lemmings? Lemmings became famous or infamous in the 1950s. When National Geographic filmed The Most Amazing Sight, but there's also this conspiracy story about Disney doing it too, so I'll come back to that story later. And in the National Geographic story, here's what they did. They went to a Pacific island, and they filled the most amazing side of thousands of big, ugly, rat-like creatures. That's what lemmings look like. Gathered together on a cliff, run right off the cliff into an ocean and commit collective suicide. And ever since, one of those big questions has been, why did they do it? I actually get about 100 emails after this class is done with scientific theories. I'm not interested in any of them. But it's a question worth asking, right? Why did they do it? Now let's do some virtual imagery. Maybe we can get the answer. You can see why the first lemming did it, right? He was going too fast. He couldn't stop off the cliff into the ocean. Incidentally, the guys can't swim. Kind of seals the deal, dead. Second lemming, too close to the first guy, also in the ocean, also dead. I'd like you to put yourself in the shoes of the very last lemming in the group. I know lemmings don't wear shoes. But kind of hang in there with the analogy anywhere. You ready? You're running as fast as you can towards a cliff. You've seen your entire tribe disappear off that cliff. I would assume you'd have second thoughts about what you were just planning to do, right? Your left brain, right brain, whatever parts are actually saying, stop, 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 don't do it. And then you hear this voice in the back of your head. You know what it's saying? They must know something that you don't. Remember those seven words, the seven most deadly words in investing. They must know something that you don't. I'll tell you when you'll hear it. I remember the first time I valued Tesla, and I came up with a value of $120 per share. And the stock was trading at $250 per share. What's your rational side saying? Don't buy that stock, right? Then you hear this voice in the back of your head. They must know something that you don't. It speaks in a monotone. Don't ask me why. And when you hear that voice, magical things start to happen to your valuation. Your growth rates start to rise. It's almost like the spreadsheet has taken on a life of its own. Your discount rates decrease. Your growth rates go up. Your cash flows get bigger. 120 becomes 140, 150, 180. It's, it's not going to stop till it gets to 250. There's a lemming inside each and every one of you dying to get out. Let it out. In fact, you can divide the whole world of investors into three groups of lemmings. The first group I call proud lemmings. I'm a lemming and I'm proud to be a lemming. They call themselves momentum investors, but it's pretty much the same thing, right? What do they do? They look for a crowd, and they join in. You're buying? I'm buying. 
you're selling, I'm selling. Why are you buying? I don't care. I can't even imagine going up to somebody saying, I'm a momentum investor. I might as well say, I'm a lemming and I'm proud to be a lemming. The second group of lemmings I call Yogi Bear lemmings. You see that movie, the Yogi Bear movie that came out like 10 years ago? My kids refused to go to the movie with me, but I went alone because I used to love the Yogi Bear comics when I was a kid. And even if you never saw the movie, you probably remember Yogi's most famous saying, right? He was smarter than the average bear. Yogi bear lemmings think they're smarter than the average lemming. Here's what they want to do. They want to run with the crowd to the very edge of the cliff and in the last moment, veer away. This sounds great, right? You get all the upside of momentum and none of the downside. Admit it, you're tempted. You think there are a lot of stupid people there. I can tell where the cliff is coming. This is a cautionary note. Have you noticed after every market crash, people come out of the woodwork saying, I saw it coming. How come you never mentioned it? You're on CNBC every day for the last four years. <laughs> Slipped your mind. After every correction, it's obvious. Of course there's going to be a correction. I can't pull off being a proud lemming. I am definitely not smarter than the average lemming. I have no idea where the cliff is coming. If you ask me to describe myself, that's me. A lemming with a life vest, that's all you can aspire to be. That's all valuation is. It throws you a life vest saying, you're human. You're going to be caught up in the mood of the moment. You're going to do things you're going to regret. All that valuation does is slow the process down, give your rational side a chance to mount an argument. Nine times out of 10, you're going to ignore it and do whatever you wanted in the first place. But maybe that one time out of 10, you can save yourself some money. That's why I do valuation. It's not going to make me rational. It's not, if I really want to do something stupid, I'll find a way to do it. But maybe you can just slow the process down. So I'm going to start off on some misconceptions about valuation. We'll continue with this next class. Here's the first misconception. I talked a little bit about this. That evaluation is somehow an objective search for the truth. That you're a scientist trying to estimate the value of an asset. You know what feeds into this? You sit in front of spreadsheets, and so in front of computers, using spreadsheets, you enter numbers, and after a while you convince yourself, it's all numbers, I'm being objective. Dispense with that delusion. There are no objective valuations. All valuations are biased. I'll give you a personal example. I have valued Microsoft every single year since 1986, from the time of its IPO. Every single time I valued Microsoft, I found it overvalued. $2 overvalued, $4 overvalued, six. Strange, right? One of the great success stories of equity markets in the last century, and I wouldn't have touched it one step of the way. I could give you access to every single Microsoft valuation I've done, and you could start digging through these numbers looking for clues, but you'd be looking in the wrong place. If you really want to know why I found Microsoft to be overvalued, all you need to do is go to KMAC, take the elevator up to the ninth floor, walk to 969 my office. Open the door. I left it open. Take whatever you want. Don't. <laughs> Walk in and look around. You're going to see four computers. I'm putting myself through a radioactive check. And on all four computers, you look at the back of the computer, you're going to see a fruit. Not a pear, not a banana, but an apple. I've been an apple user since 1981. In fact, if you look around long enough in my office, you look towards the top, you'll see my Mac 128K. Those of you who don't remember, that was the very first Mac. It came without a hard drive. I have it in my office. I'm an Apple user. To me, Microsoft has always been the Darth Vader of technology. If you're a Star Wars fan, let me be very specific. I'm not talking Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader. I'm talking Darth, Darth Vader, what, guy who never takes a shower, wears only black, has a strange voice. I have lots of bad thoughts about Bill Gates. They all come bubbling up to the surface when I sit down to value Microsoft. Because in valuation, you constantly come to forks in the road. High growth or low growth? Who buys this rotten product? Low growth. High risk or low risk? You're one virus away from blowing up high risk. By the time I make my choices, the end result is foregone. I am far too biased to value Microsoft, and I know it. But you know who else I'm far too biased to value? Apple, which is strange because I've been valuing Apple every, th every three months on my blog going back to 2009. And go back and look at the very first blog post I had on valuing Apple. I spent half the post telling people, don't trust me. I like this company too much. 
And the reason I have to do that is if I don't do that, I'm going to delude myself. So when I find Apple to be undervalued, I have to stop and think, did I find it undervalued because it's really undervalued, or did I find it undervalued because I want it to be undervalued? Be honest with yourself. In fact, what I suggest is when you pick a company to value in your group project, here's what I'd like you to write on a sheet of paper. I think I'm going to find this company to be undervalued or overvalued. Make your job, you say, but I haven't looked at the value. Just give me instinctively what you think you will find. At the end of the semester, let's do a correlation between what you thought you would find before you sat down to do the valuation and what you actually found. All valuations are biased. In fact, I'll close with a statement. I'll back this up when we start off next class. You tell me who pays you to do a valuation. I'll tell you which direction the bias is and how much the bias is. Think about that until the next class and start now I'll send you a couple of links so you can start building on this but we will start with that concept see you on Monday back in your class uh, I wanted to ask I was thinking for the company of choosing a company back in Venezuela uh, However, yeah, I wanted to know that. Yeah, public or something? Uh, public. It has it's going to be tough. It'll, it'll be a challenge. That's, More I'm, macro than micro challenge, yeah. right? Be good. Uh, well, I have two options. I can either do a public company or a private company. If it's a private company, get, you have to get the financial. I have access to everything. Yeah. Hello, right. Hello, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, how are you? See you here. Okay. Nice to meet you. Thanks for a lecture. You're it's welcome. Really, yeah. Just so, yeah, so actually we too are coming from the stock real estate program. The what program? Real estate program, the okay. checking institute. So okay. yeah, so just want to make sure like we get a copy from it, like as, uh, you know, based on like the real estate side. Yeah, so I'm not. I just want to confirm that we could maybe just do it like with the. Real well, if you can, if you don't, if something looks foreign, then you can always go back and look at the material and make All sure right. you catch up. So. All right. My entire corporate finance class is online too, so if you oh, want really? to take it, you know, you're welcome to. So. I actually have a question. Yeah. So, like you mentioned um, about the lending, like the valuation, like how it, it's one thing like you do a valuation and have a valuation of the company with your thoughts, and mm -hmm. another thing is the, like the price, the stock, the, the price, like the stock's trading at, um, and market sentiment mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Like, right. For example, I'm thinking about. Like, the, you're thinking about what? Rates. Rates, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like overpriced relative to what? Have you actually valued these REITs or just your gut feeling that they're overpriced? Um, I, I did couple as retail REITs. Uh, couple doesn't do it, right? Those couple might have been overvalued. So when you make I statements like that collectively over... That's the challenge in this class is let... I'm going to pull you back from the ledge when you make statements like those, not because the statement might not be true, but I think it's easy to say social media companies are overvalued, tech companies are overvalued, ride-sharing companies are overvalued, but when you make that statement, you have to back it up. So we'll talk about the tools and the techniques, and real estate is a pricing game. Collectively, it's a pricing game. There's no valuation in real estate. I'll tell you off, off front, when you see a real estate valuation, it's really a real estate pricing, because the biggest number is what you think you can sell this property for five or ten years from now. So it's kind of, and that's fine. It's a pricing game. So in real estate, the big skill is pricing skills. Can you price a property based on the other information? And timing skills. Can you get out of the pricing game when it, in other words, before the, the, the correction happens in either direction? So I think, in, and that's why I want you to think about pricing versus valuation. You learn a lot of valuation tools here that you're going to take back to real estate. And when you try those tools, the real estate developer is going to say, I don't care. And rather than view him as crazy or stupid, you've got to think about the game he's playing. He's playing a pricing game, and he really shouldn't care about value. Right, what, 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 what about like, on company level? Like, on Same thing, company? right? Real estate, REITs are just flow through through. If real estate is overpriced, REITs are going to be overpriced. Yeah. Right? But, so, but, but, or like, back then, like, when they were, like, the, all the profits were worth more than, like, and every year is more that's than... That's the nature of the pricing game, right? But the then price, now it's, like, overpriced. That's, that's the nature of the price. So, again, don't use the word overpriced. Okay. The prices can go up and down. 
there'll be corrections. It's not good, not bad. That's the way markets work. Sometimes they overshoot, sometimes they undershoot. The reason you're doing valuation is when they overshoot collectively, you have to then decide. And here's why it's going to be tough. Let's say real estate properties shoot way above their intrinsic values across the board. If you're a real estate developer, what should you do? And you believe in value, what should you be doing? You should be getting out of real estate, right? And unfortunately, that might not be a choice. So that's what makes people go from value to price, is to survive in this game and to play this game. It's not a matter what you and I think about the value of real estate, because if the prices of real estate have taken off, in a sense, you're, that's a game you're playing, and you've got to play that game or get out of the game. So that's part of the reason in this class I'm going to explore valuation, I'm going to explore pricing. But in the context of real estate, go back and look at what you've learned about appraisal techniques. And one of the things I'd like you to do when you're in this class is think about those appraisal techniques and ask, was I valuing real estate or was I pricing real estate? And we'll give, we'll, I'll give you ways of distinguishing the right. two because they're two different. Pricing, I mean, this is, this is simple. The value comes from cash flow. So if you have a rental property, the value of a rental property is based on what? The expected rental income you're going to make on this property forever. But let's say the rental property is in a part of the country where the prices of real estate are taking off. So the pricing game can be driven by entire, so you can have the price be very different, and you have to decide whether you want to get, get out of real estate because you're a value real estate investor, in which case you'll have no real estate at all, or whether you...